I'm Ken Bamberger, I'm a professor here at the law school, and I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of both the Robbins Collection at Berkeley Law and the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. In what's now our sixth year of collaboration on the Robbins Collection Lecture in Jewish Law and Thought. A few words about both institutions. The Robbins Collection, established in 1952, is at the physical heart of the law school. It is an international center for comparative legal and historical studies that attracts students and leading scholars from universities around the world, and its library ranks among the very best in the fields of religious and civil law. In particular, its collection in Jewish law, shepherded by its former director, Professor David Doby, one of the world's leading academics in the field of Roman and Jewish law, and now by its current director, Professor Laurent Maillie, is truly something special. So my thanks to Professor Maile and to Andrea Quinn, the Robbins Assistant Director. And the Berkeley Institute, founded only three years ago, which hosts two programs. The Berkeley Program in Jewish Law, Thought, and Identity, through which the Robbins Lecture is organized, and the Berkeley Program on Israel Studies, which has grown in a short time to a top 10 national program. The Institute serves primarily as a hub for student support and faculty engagement through programs, classes, mentorship, and community building. At the same time, we're pleased that some of our programming, like this lecture, can bring the exciting work that's happening on campus to a wider audience. And for this, we thank you for your ongoing support, which makes the work we do possible. We hope to see you at our future programs, including next week on November 13th, a joint program at the Magnus, featuring Schusterman visiting Israeli artist and Paitan Yair Harel and Professor Robert Alter and spring programs by Yossi Klein-Halevi, Ruth Calderon discussing Talmud for the People, and a conference coordinated with the Center for Jewish Studies on the 70th anniversary of the Nuremberg Trials. And I also note another program next week sponsored by the Center for Jewish Studies, uh, in which scholar Liana Fink speaks on her new graphic novel, which is based on the Bintel brief letters from the forwards. And there are flyers about that too outside. Now to the substance. We're truly blessed to be able to learn with Professor Moshe Halbertal as he talks about the latest of many subjects that he's mastered, Maimonides. You will hear more about him in a moment. Professor Halbertal, welcome to Berkeley. And we are equally blessed, and it is really fun to be able to call on one of the leaders of our own Bay Area and Jewish communities to convene these proceedings. At the Graduate Theological Union, Dr. Tricia Hellman Gibbs has focused her work also on Maimonides, writing on the role that the juxtaposition of Arabic and Hebrew plays in Maimonides' project to transform the basic Jewish concepts regarding, regarding God and God's relationship with the human being. Central here, Trisha's interest focuses on the contributions of the Rambam of Maimonides to discourses on health, and she's worked on his various medical treatises, including the medical section of the Mishneh Torah, his regimen on health, treatise on asthma, and most recently, his commentary on the first aphorism of Hippocrates, which she believes to be a remedy for much that ails our medical system today. And these pursuits are not merely theoretical for Tricia. She is a physician, as many of you know, 
and with her husband Richard, she co-founded the award-winning San Francisco Free Clinic, which provides free accessible medical treatment to those without health insurance. It's a pleasure and exceedingly appropriate to have her launch this program on Maimonides, known as the Great Healer. Thank you, welcome. Good evening, I hope everybody can hear me. It's really a pleasure to see everybody tonight and to be here with Moshe Halbertal. It's really an honor. And I have the pleasure of speaking about two people I greatly admire. One is Moshe Ben Maimon and the other Moshe Halbertal. You may have noticed they both have the same first name. Coincidence? I don't think so. so let me begin by introducing the current day Moshe and his book, Maimonides, Life and Thought. Moving on after that to frame the topic discussion with a few thoughts and questions. So when Kim Bamberger first asked me to introduce Professor Halbertal, I jumped at the chance because as most people who know me understand, I am a lover of Maimonides. So much so that my five grown kids now call me Maimonides. Um, <laughs> And of course, I knew Professor Halbertal had just written a fantastically successful new book about my hero. So I, I didn't really know Moshe Halbertal until today, but I certainly knew of his books. Even so, I had the rather odd feeling that since he'd written a book on Maimonides, we probably already shared a lot. It would be very difficult to cover all of Moshe Halbertal's achievements and still have any time left to talk about anything um, about the topic tonight. But just to give you a brief survey of the highlights, um, Moshe Halbertal was born in Uruguay and grew up in Israel, in Jerusalem, from the age of eight. He is currently the Gruss professor at NYU Law School and received his BA cum laude from Hebrew University, which is where he also received his PhD, which won awards, by the way. He has been full professor at Hebrew University and a fellow or visiting lecturer at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. He's taught at Harvard, Yale, UPenn, and NYU law schools. He has many distinguished awards, including the Kennedy Lee Prize for Distinguished PhD, a loan prize from Hebrew University, the Bruno Award of the Rothschild Foundation, 2001 Goran Goldstein Prize for the best book in Jewish studies between 1997 and 2000, in 2010, he was named a member of Israel's Academy for the Sciences and the Humanities. Notably, Moshe also composed the Israeli Defense Force's ethical manual. Do most countries have ethical manuals? I don't know, but he wrote Israel's. Most recently, his book, Maimonides' Life and Thought, received the Nahum Sarna National Jewish Book Award for Scholarship, and that book is the main subject of tonight's lecture. Who is Moses Maimonides, and why is Moshe Halbertal's book about him so important? Novelist Dara Horn captured the answer to this question in her January 2014 Wall Street Journal review. Mr. Halbertal's achievement here is that he presents these two projects, the Mishnah Torah and the Guide of the Perplexed, as a single one, a bold attempt by Maimonides to make sense of faith for an educated audience in an advanced civilization. According to Moshe Halbertal, and I'm summarizing, paraphrasing, what Moshe Ben Maimon attempted to accomplish with his two most famous works was nothing less than a complete transformation of Judaism, from a religion of myth and superstition to one of rationality and intellect. I said before, perhaps a bit jokingly, that it was no coincidence that Moshe and Moshe share a surname. They do, in fact, share certain critical attributes, most importantly, a brilliant aptitude for organizing material. Here's how Moshe Halbertal describes this phenomenon in the case of Maimonides. In its novel organization of the halakha, Mishneh Torah does not merely impose an external structure on the halakhic material. It also interprets and shapes the material itself. This is also what Moshe Halbertal himself does with Maimonides' prolific works. He makes order out of seemingly disparate ideas, finding patterns, listing conclusions in clear and elegant language, making it possible to access concepts that might otherwise remain obscure. Which brings me to the lecture topic, Maimonides on Mourning, 
Jewish law and emotion. I should mention first that Moshe Halbertal is a great question asker. He often structures his chapters by first asking a question and then systematically answering it. So here's the question he poses at the beginning of the section on mourning. What can account for the placement in the midst of the Book of Judges, a, track, a tract that deals primarily with constitutional law, and the structuring of society's authoritative institutions of a set of laws associated with an individual's life cycle events and his reaction to death? In other words, why place laws about mourning in the middle of a book about judges? So I don't want to steal any punchlines. I just want to ask a few questions myself. So I will say only that the answer to this question reveals the way Maimonides' organizational methods can radically change the practical halakha. In this way, mourning becomes not a means of psychological or therapeutic response to death, but something else entirely, which I'll leave to Professor Halbertal, to explain if that's his intention. <laughs> but as for me, this topic makes me ask, what in the heck does emotion have to do with law? But now I remember we're not talking about just any law. We're talking about Jewish law, the very same law that gives us a commandment to love God, as stated in Deuteronomy 6.5, you shall love the Lord your God, a commandment Maimonides enumerates as the third of the positive commandments in this selfsame Mishnah Torah. So clearly, law, at least Jewish law, does seem to have something to say about emotion. So this very first basic question for me is, what does it mean to command emotion? Then the issue of mourning itself brings up questions. Is mourning an emotion or an action? Thinking it through, it seems to me that grief is the emotion and mourning is the action, perhaps even the ritual, the thing that other people see. And this makes me wonder what happens when the emotion and the external behavioral expectations are way out of sync, like we see most dramatically in the case of Aaron, who shockingly remained silent when his two sons, Nadav and Abihu, died violently at God's hands for offering alien fire. If mourning has a different function, according to Maimonides, then we might expect, and I won't tell you what that other meaning is, what still is the place of emotion within this system? And the third question, which is always of interest when studying the Mishnah Torah in contrast with Maimonides' own behavior, how well did Maimonides himself adhere to these laws of mourning? Well, this has all gotten me very curious, so I will stop talking and allow Moshe Halbertal to come speak about his wonderful book. Thank you. And just should mention, there will be a question and answer session afterwards. Well, uh, thank you for the warm and <coughs> lovely introduction. And thanks from the center to, for inviting me for this lecture. It's a, a real honor. And as was mentioned in the introduction, um, I want to start reflecting on Maimonides' conception on morning, on a kind of a technical problem, but I think it's underlying a real issue. Maimonides wrote the Mishneh Torah, and when he's writing the Mishneh Torah, he decides to divert from the way halacha was organized before him. He said, I'm not going to follow the Mishnah, I'm not going to follow the Talmud, I'm going to impose a new structure. And one of the achievements of the Mishneh Torah is really the architecture, the new architecture of halacha. This is not a matter just of shifting some, um, some books from this shelf to that shelf. Actually, he does something much more bolder. For example, in his organization of halacha, he creates new areas of law that didn't exist before him. For example, he has a compilation of law called Ilchot Tshuva, the laws of repentance. You look all over the Talmud, there isn't tractate about repentance. I mean, the Talmud deals with repentance, but there isn't a section, a body of law to deal with repentance. Now, Maimonides basically created a body of law that deals with repentance that was then uh, triggered a whole literature on repentance dealing with Maimonides' text. For example, another thing that Maimonides has, he has laws concerning Talmud Torah, laws, he has a section, Ilchot Talmud Torah, 
This is a new section. I mean, there is no tractat that deals with laws of Talmud Torah. So Maimonides, in organizing his halachic material, picks a new form. Uh, and that form, as was mentioned, is not only a rearrangement, but is an imposition of a new order that many times it's a radical reinterpretation of the prior material. Now we come to our topic, laws of mourning, Ilchot Evel. Ilchot Evel are a, a section in the Mishneh Torah. And if I would say, what is the most difficult editorial question in the Mishneh Torah? I think if my money is said, head and editor of the Mishneh Torah, I would send this volume. He would say, the first question I have, what are you doing with mourning? Maimonides places mourning in the section of the Mishneh Torah called Sefer Shoftim, the, uh, the book that deals with judges. You look at this book, basically it's from the point of view of legal structures, it's mainly constitutional law and public law. And actually mourning, Ilchot Evel, is placed in between laws of rebels, Ilchot Mamrim, and laws of kings. Now, this is a very strange thing. And by the way, from all, I, we can learn a lot from Maimonides' organizational uh, uh, method in the Mishneh Torah, many things. This is a very, very, I would say, strange, uh, complex problem. Uh, now, I, I want to say, if you look at the Shulchan Aruch, who's another code, Yosef uh, Karo, um, um, Rabbi Yosef Karo, the, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, has another technique. He, all the stuff that doesn't find a place in the Shulchan Aruch is at the end of your Edea. At the end of, so he has there Ilchot Zdaka, Ilchot Evel, he drops there, Yei Nesech. But this is not Maimonides. Maimonides doesn't work that. It's not like, well, I don't have a place for Evel, why not to put it towards the end of the book? If someone will tell them to Maimonides, you get really furious. This is not the way he works. And we know that besides the, like every great legal text, let's say like the Mishnah, and the Mishnah Torah is also an achievement in the Hebrew language. It's um, everybody who reads Maimonides Hebrew, you know, cholesterol-free Hebrew, I would say. So it's kind of, there's a, there is a clarity and, and, and what's, what's unique about the style is you don't feel the sweat. This is why it's so elegant, but you know how much effort went into it. But it, it doesn't leave the scars of sweating and endeavor. This is what, like seeing a good dancer performs a very complicated movement without sweating, without effort. So there is an elegance to the book. The language is exquisite. And here is a huge editorial problem. Now, by the way, I just, say few technical, add to few technical issues to this editorial problem, and forgive me about that, this will be in some ways the last really technical issues in the Mishnah Torah. If you look at the unit itself, you begin to write to read Ilchot Evel. You, you read laws of mourning in the Mishnah Torah. And Maimonides starts as he always will start a section. He says there is a commandment for, from the Torah to, um, uh, to mourn for the dead. He mentions a, a proof text, etc. That's what he does in many texts. Then he says, you know, something, something quite expected. He says, when does mourning start? When is the time of mourning? We know that the time of mourning is after burial. You don't mourn the dead before burial. And Maimonides has two, three halachot that deals with actually questions about status of mourning when you don't know when, uh, whether there was a burial, for example, the body is missing, um, uh, you hear about death, uh, you, uh, the dead is sent somewhere to be buried, but you not, don't know when he will be buried. So my monads give you some laws concerning the time of mourning. That, by the way, this is also classic, right? First you define the obligation, then you define when it kicks in, when the time begins. But then he does something very strange. He begins the whole section whom you don't mourn for, right? So for example, a fetus. You, you don't mourn for a fetus. A fetus is not, a, 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 after an abortion, a, a fetus is not 
This is not a non-American statement. A fetus is not a, a full-fledged human being, I mean, at least according to al um, uh, Then there is, uh, then there, there, there are other, other things he said. He, he said, whom you not mourn? Uh, and then he says, for example, something else is quite troubling for, for um, pluralistic or liberal approaches to, to life. He said, there, some, there is a group of people we don't mourn. For example, people who were executed by the court. Arugay uh, Beidin. And I actually asked friends in, in law schools and other places, what, what do you do here after someone is executed? This is still a place where there is practices, executions. Uh, what, do you, what do you do? What, are there rituals of, of, of burial, mourning? How is it practiced, etc.? But anyhow, according to Maimonides, uh, uh, all of uh, the end of the first chapter of, of laws of mourning is whom you don't mourn for. And that includes, uh, uh, as Maimonides will say, aporshimi darkei tzibur, all those who withdrew from the communal life, the heretics, etc., etc., etc. Then, in chapter two, here's another editorial comment, if I wanted to be, if I dare be Maimonides' editor, in chapter two he says, whom you mourn for? And he says, the relatives, you know, the close relatives, the, the father, the mother, uh, your brother and sister, your son, your daughter, uh, etc. There, there is a group of relatives. Then he does something very strange, uh, or rather complex, another editorial comment. Uh, he says, well, um, in the middle of chapter two, where, where actually he should have started to a certain degree, he's, he begins to say, those whom a person is obligated to mourn for are actually those whom the priest is allowed, or actually, according to Maimonides, commanded to defile himself. You know that priests cannot defile themselves dealing with the dead. But, but relatives, they, he has to defile. And he says the same group of relatives that you're obligated to mourn for, the priest is, is uh, uh, obligated to defile himself for. And then he goes on for two chapters. This is kind of an internal, another editorial scandal. He goes for two chapters to deal with issues of defilement, priests and defilement of the dead, etc., etc. He has a whole section in Ilkhot Tahara in Laws of Purity concerning death and defilement of death that he puts in, uh, in the Mishneh Torah. Why do I mention that, all these questions? Because I think I have one solution to all of them. I mean, this is a, I hope so. Uh, but what I'm saying the following, just stating the issue and then we'll go to substance. The first question is really uh, the placing of mourning and whether that reflects a certain conceptual understanding of mourning. And the second, all those internal issues that I have elaborated of the very structure of the unit itself that is very complicated. Um, <clears throat> okay. Let me say something about uh, the background. And here I'm going to relate also to some issues of law and emotion and other mm -hmm. questions that you have raised that are very serious questions. We, I think for many, I think for, I would speak for many Jews, I speak also for myself. Uh, there is a, an understanding that one of the biggest achievements of halacha is the rituals of avelut, the shiva, the 30 days, the year. A lot of people who, walk, who go through mourning and, and observe the customs of avelut, of shiva, etc., they say that there is a lot of wisdom in it. There is something wise about this structure, deeply personal, it's, catharsis, it's a cathartic experience. It allows for time. Uh, I, I know from in other, in other places when mourning is not practiced, how difficult it is, the shift for, from burial to life. I mean, here you allowed some, some time that allows you to, the, the, the work of grief. So there, there is high, something highly personal. Um, I, you would say psychologically deep about this structure that even 
makes Maimonides' own project even more troubling. Why is a deeply human, psychological, personal ritual part of public law? And uh, calibrated a little bit in more refined ways, uh, what is mourning? And you have asked serious questions about that. When we look at the Talmud, and the Talmud in Tractat Moed Katan begins to discuss the rituals of the mourner. And he, there are two, uh, two and a half pages of Talmud in Tractat Moed Katan that are devoted to that. And the Talmud makes a, a rather surprising analogy. And he says, well, he says, Avel mau betisporet. Should, uh, can Avel uh, uh, shave himself, cut his hair? And there is a quotation that shows actually that part of the uh, rituals of Avelut, of mourning, is you don't shave. And then it says, and then it makes an analogy between the mourner and the excommunicated, the band, a menude. And it goes on for two pages to make comparison between the mourner and the excommunicated, which is actually, uh, uh, I learned that this text Many years ago, and when my father, Alava Shalom, passed away, I thought a lot about this text. And, and by the way, there, there are six aspects where the Talmud makes a comparison between the mourner and the excommunicated. The mourner doesn't shave. The mourner doesn't wash his clothes. He's not lo The mourner doesn't wash himself. The mourner is, is not allowed to wear shoes, to wear neilata sandal, to wear his shoes. The mourner, like the excommunicated, this is a practice we don't do, he practice atifat arosh, he, has, he, cover, he veils his face, we don't do that. And the mourner, like the menude, this is something that is practiced, asur b'shi'ilat shalom, he doesn't open to a person who comes to him with shalom. Right? The other person, uh, uh, if at all, has to initiate. All these, all these items are, are in analogy with the excommunicated, with the menude. And I want to uh, dwell a little bit on this analogy. By the way, you look, mourning practices are not practices of fasting or pain or grief in grief in the sense of expressing uh, um, kind of outward expressing of pain. The mourner is allowed to eat, he's fed. Uh, uh, he's, he, um, um, there is something else going on. All those, all those laws are really about losing your social persona. You, you come, you don't shave, you don't wash yourself. Uh, we know how difficult it is, by the way. I mean, you, it's very difficult. You don't, you don't wash your clothes. You don't say shalom. You are an outcast. You lose your social persona. And the, and the depth behind it, by the way, washing, just to show you that it's not about not having joy or pleasure like Yom Kippur, like Day of Atonement, Washing, the mourner is not allowed even to wash himself in cold water. It's not about the, the sensation of the hot, the pleasure of the hot water. He has to, if I may say so, he has to stink. Uh, what is it about? And what's the, you might say, wisdom? Why it is captures something authentic? And then maybe I can say a few things about is it an emotion or not? The, a lot of the, the initial experience of mourning is separation. You have lost someone dear, and the world goes on. And immediately you feel separated from the world. I think everyone who has gone through that, I think, experienced a sense of separation. And by the way, one trouble, one, one, the, the, one of the troubling aspect of the isolated stance of grief has to do with the huge gap 
between you, your experience, and the way it doesn't resonate anywhere in the world. Nature goes on, life goes on, and you are there isolated. And there is another thing, which is you lose, you lose by losing someone whom you are close to, you lose the umbilical cord that attached to, to the world. You lose your main attachment. And this is why, the, if you ask me to be more refined about what's going on, it's a, the mourner acts out his experience of isolation. He loses his social persona. It's not about being in pain. It's not about, there are other, other traditions have mourning practices where you wound yourself. Actually, by the way, the Torah uh, prohibits, uh, 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 you know, wounding yourself, punishing yourself. It's a different experience. It's an experience of isolation. The community wants to draw you back. It comes to you to draw you back. It comes to you to free you or relieve you from something that the community can do, which is relieve you from the sense of isolation. We also stopped. We also stopped for you. That's the difference, by the way, between the excommunicated and the mourner. The excommunicated wants to belong, and he's pushed away and, and imposed structures of, of iso social isolation. The mourner acts out isolated. He has no shoes. He cannot go out. He's, by the way, veiling the face. There was a, a, an old halacha. Uh, he, he stinks. He's, he's not washed, doesn't shave. He doesn't, he doesn't care about appearing. And the community lures him back to the world. I just want to say there is a very interesting halacha which captures the, this whole structure. It's really the choreography of the mourner and the mourner relationship to space. The halacha says, I'm quoting from Masechet Sofrim, <coughs> sorry, Masechet Smachot, that deals with mourning practices, and it says the following. Shavua Rishon lo yetzer mi beito. The first week, a mourner doesn't leave his house. Shavua Sheni, yotzer mi beito lebet haknesset, he goes from his home to the synagogue, avalo yoshev bimkomo. He doesn't sit in his own place. Shavua shlishi, the third, the third week, the mourner sits in his, yoshev bimkomo veino medaber im afechad. He sits without talking to anyone. Shavua revii, he sits in his place and begins to talk. So I would say now I'm using a Freudian term. The work of mourning, right? Freud, Freud in his essay on on mourning and melancholy. What is the work of mourning? The work of mourning, as practiced by Alaha, by this idea, the way it's structured in the ritual of mourning, is bringing the mourner back to the world after an initial isolation and loss of interest in the world, lure him back. It's not, Freud describes the work of mourning as separating from the dead a gradual, healthy separation from the dead. It's really not a separation from the dead. I don't think, by the way, we ever separate from the dead. They're inside us. The issue is really how to go back to the world. Uh, and the mourning work with the comforting, with this is really uh, 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 the praxis of return, which we know how difficult it is. It's gradual, it's difficult, it's, it's difficult to come back. So we have all this structure. Uh, and I would say it's not a motion in the, in the morning is not an emotion. I would say morning is acting out ritually an attitude, a disposition of isolation. It engulfs the whole self. It's not like grief. It's, it's existential in, in the larger sense. And it's work. I mean, it doesn't do all things. Clearly, there are other issues. Its work is really the return. The way it's actually described, as I said, geographically or in the text of the mourner's place. Now, you look at Maimonides. You have this background. And you ask yourself, where is Maimonides going with all that material? Well, clearly, he, he takes from the Talmud, he legislates, he does a lot. And I think 
And I'm coming back to the placement of mourning in his thought. And I want to speak about one halacha, one, one halacha, an innovation of Maimonides, which I think is the key for his conception of mourning as he understood it, which I think will explain his uh, organizational structure. Uh, this is an halacha in, uh, <coughs> towards the end of Ilchot Avelut. where Maimonides says, I'm going to read it in the Hebrew and then translate it. He says the following. It's actually, Hebrew-wise, it's a complicated construct. He says, a dead that has no mourners to be comforted. A dead person, for example, we know a dead person has no relatives. There's no man to mourn for him and nobody to comf be comforted as a result. Now comes a very interesting halacha, I think a, a deep halacha. Ba'im asara bne adam ksherim, ten people come, v'yoshvim bimkomo kol shivat yemei avelut. The community, this is a communal obligation, has to bring in ten people who have no relation to him. He has no mourners. And they sit Shiva for him. And the rest of the people comfort those 10 people who came to mourn for the dead. It's, it's quite unique, right? What is the idea behind it? The idea behind it is the following. You cannot leave, you cannot allow a situation of a death that doesn't leave any mark. This is a frightening idea. Someone dies and there is no one even to, it's an unfelt moment. By the way, it shows that the life itself was weightless. I remember, I actually remember once, this halacha itself, there was a terror uh, a bomb in, in, in the crossroad in Megiddo, it's years ago. And there was one person from the bus that wasn't identified for months. Usually, you know, those bodies are so decimated how they are identified, relatives come and say, this, this one is missing. They do DNA che uh, check and they identify. Here's one person who for months, nobody came to say that he's missing. He's, he's, uh, and I said, we should gather 10 people for him to mourn for him and bring, and maybe to know something about his life, to, to collect something that death has to leave Mark. Now, if you look at this idea, mourning, by the way, there is no catharsis. You don't say, well, mourning is a therapeutic practice to allow catharsis to the mourner. That's not the issue because nobody is in a condition of grief. Mourning is a social ritual that aims at conferring life with dignity, right? That's the idea. It's a social ritual that says the community has to. It begins with the relative. They have to stop their life. They have to express the fact that someone is missing. If there is no relatives, the community has to put. It's interesting, Maimonides' language, asara nashim ksherim. Let them be honorable and decent people, right? Uh, who come and see Shiva for that person in order to express this idea of the dignity of, of the dead, the dig kvodamet, the dignity of the, the dead, you might say conferring weight to his life, because a life that passed without leaving any mark is, is a frightening concept of life. Now, it's very interesting. You read this halacha, which is, a very, I think, a deep idea. 
of the concept of mourning. Ravad, Rabbi Avram ben David, who's a Provencal scholar from Maimonides' own time, he was an alachic giant that could criticize Maimonides on every field of law, right? He wrote hasagot, he wrote uh, comments on the Mishneh Torah. By the way, his first comment on the Mishneh Torah, you see kind of a hostility. Um, the Mishneh Torah also drew quite a lot of hostility. It was too bold. And the Ravat says, this, this, uh, this author thought uh, he's doing something constructive, he's correcting something, but actually he didn't correct anything. And what's his complaint? He says, why doesn't he mention the, the sources in which he draws the halacha? Because now we readers who disagree with him don't know, maybe he had another text that we don't know about. So by actually extracting himself from the rest of the Talmud, creating this clear, transparent document, he actually, it's a self-defeating moment, at least according to Ravad. By the way, Ravad comes to this halacha and bluntly says, Davar ze en lo shoresh. This law has no ground, has no basis. Now I'm going to talk a, li a little bit about Maimonides as an interpreter of the Talmud. There is, by the way, a basis to the law in the Talmud. But Maimonides does here something very creative. I'm going to read the section on the Talmud, the Maimonides, very interesting section, and then read Maimonides' own reading of this section, and then come back to Maimonides' concept of mourning. This is a section from Tractat Shabbat that deals with issues of death, and it begins with a statement, a, a rather Interesting statement of Rav Chizda, one of the Amoraim. It's Tractat Shabbat Kuf Nun Bet, 152. Rav Chizda says, Amar Rav Chizda, nafsho shel adam mitabelet alav kol shiv'ah. Shenemar, venafsho alav teval. Rav Chizda says, this is an interesting idea, that the person who's dying, the dead person, is in mourning about himself for seven days after his death. His soul is in mourning. Nafsho shel adam mitabelet alav kol shiva. Now comes another statement. Amar av Yehuda, met she'en lo menachmim, a dead person that has no comforters, met she'en lo menachmim, הולכים יוד בני אדם ויושבים במקומו. Ten people come and sit in his place. By the way, you can see that Maimonides drew his law from here. Soon we'll discuss what he's doing. Now a story, a beautiful story. Ahu de shachiv b'shvivu teider Rav Yudah. A person died in the neighborhood of Rav Yudah. Lo ayu lo menachamim, he had no comforters. כל יומה, every day, אב הדבר, רב יהודה קולקטד, בי עשרה, היא קולקטד טן פיפול, ויאטיב בדוכתה, and he sat in his place. לאחר שבעה ימים, after seven days, התחלזי בחיל מידי רב יהודה. He, he came, he appeared in the dream of רב יהודה, dead, dead person. ואמר לי, תנוח דעתך שהנחת את דעתי. May your, may your uh, דעתך. רוברט, you have to help me here. Uh, uh, your soul, <laughs> yes, set your mind at rest so you, uh, uh, because you have set my mind at rest. Tanuach da'atcha she'enach ta'edati. Now, let's analyze this text. You look very carefully at the text, which actually other legal Jewish tradition follow it. It has a very interesting occult, maybe, concept, which is the dead himself is mourning about himself, and he needs comforters. When he has no comforters, and lo menachmim, you gather 10 people, they sit in his place, and they presumably sit there and comfort, to comfort the dead. And here's a story about Rav Yudah who practiced that, 
And the dead comes to him in the dream and says, may your mind rest for um, causing my mind to rest. Tanuach da'atcha she'enach ta'edate. By the way, this is, if you follow the Talmud straightforward, it's not the structure that Maimonides discusses. We don't talk about 10 people mourning and the rest of the community coming to comfort them. No, no. The 10 people are not mourners. They coming to comfort the dead who is in mourning. And this is the way it was practiced in Ashkenaz. By the way, this, this is the way that it was practiced in the Geonic time before Maimonides. There is a, a response of Rav Hai, it's quoted. Rav Hai, one of the greatest Geonim of the 10th century, uh, 10, 11th century. And Rav Hai says, yes, we come, if there is a mourner, if there is a dead person that doesn't, uh, doesn't have um, comforters, we come, we sit there, we, say, we, we pray, and we go. Every day we do that. He, he has a completely different structure. And when Ravat sees Maimonides, he says this, Maimonides' own construction has no base. Okay, now let's think about Maimonides. First of all, Maimonides is not the person to think that the soul, this is not the type of Maimonides' own metaphysics, right? That the dying soul for seven days is still mourning about its own death. This is not the stuff Maimonides likes, right? This is a little bit too occult. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, like, a, like a good reader of the, re-reader of the Talmud, he does, he adds a tough. Rather than menachmim, he said mitnachamim. A dead person that has no one to be comforted for, right? Meaning, he rereads the text. Uh, uh, the, the issue is not the dying person who is in mourning that needs comforting. It's a completely different problem. He has no one to mourn for him, and therefore we have to bring 10 people to sit and mourn for him. And you do it in such a way that the rest of the community comes to comfort those who see Shiva for the dead person. I mean, I'm sorry, this is a little bit technical, but it's a nice way to see how Maimonides, with, in a subtle way, rereads it, its, its text. In this case, he doesn't like the magical assumptions. And by not liking the magical assumptions and rereading the text, he introduces a bold, very deep idea about mourning, which is mourning is not about catharsis or not only about cathartic expression of grief, but it's about a ritual way in which people say, if there aren't relatives, the community says someone is missing. By the way, I just want to say there are families whom sometimes you have to obligate the relatives to sit shiva. Maybe they're chas shalom happy. Maybe they're indifferent. I mean, it doesn't include all the families, but children, I, it's very complicated. And, and from Maimonides' perception, the children have to sit shiva, not only to express their grief, but to say someone is missing. So it's, it it's really has to always relate backward to life itself. Because if you know the community doesn't allow that kind of weightlessness, that changes relationship to life. Now, I just want to say, one, uh, uh, there, there, in Maimonides, in Provence, where Ravad was, there was a follower, a great follower of Maimonides, called Meiri, Menachem Meiri, who wrote a big text called Beit Abkhira, Interpretation of the Talmud, very Maimonidean. By the way, he comes to this text itself, and I'll, I'm going to read you uh, uh, um, Meiri's reading. Menachemim. If a deceased has no comforters, this is actually the language of the Talmud. Now he rereads it in Maimonides' term. That is, he has no mourners who would be in need of comforting. Then ten men come all seven days and sit in the house in which he died, and others come and surround them as if they are in need in comforting, 
And that is, is for quod amet, for the honor of the deceased. That's a Maimonidian reading. Okay, I'm coming now to solve the editorial reading. That's an editorial problem. This wasn't the main thing, but you know, for, for a scholar, at least the way I grew up, a yeshiva student, to answer a shvere rambam, to, you know, to, to give a, 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 this is the highest achievement you can have as a thinker, right? There is a problematic Maimonides and you make sense of him, that's a big achievement, so why not? Uh, uh, so I'm saying the following thing. Okay. If you look at Maimonides' conception of a morning, it's really about conferring membership. Mourning is, is a public affair, right? It's a public affair because the boundaries of the community are defined by the person whom, if he dies, the community stops, whether he has relatives or not. This is why, by the way, Maimonides begins his alachot with whom you don't mourn for, including all those outsiders because mourning defines for him the boundaries of the community. By the way, this is why, for him, burial and mourning are of the same issue. I just want to say something about burial. We know this is already a biblical theme, but goes through the ultimate humiliation of a person that after he dies, there will be nobody to bury him or her. We know that. And we know that there is a category in Allah called Met Mitzvah, a dead who everybody is commended, meaning a dead who has nobody to bury him. And even a high priest is obligated to defile himself and to bury that person. Right, this is the concept of met mitzvah. Uh, by the way, a lot of halachot, met mitzvah kaname komo, for example, if you find a dead body, who nobody buries him, he owns the ground that he is found in. That's his burial place. There, there are many halachot around this issue. Basically, by the way, a person who has nobody to mourn for, he is, he is the equivalent of a, of a person who has nobody to bury him. And Maimonides says a very interesting thing. Why is it that the priests, and what's the connection between burial and the priestly obligation to bury relatives? Because the priestly obligation to bury relatives is, comes out of the fear, out of the anxiety, that if priests will be so stringent about not touching a dead person, their relative will have no one what? To bury him. This is why with all their distancing from the dead, when it comes to their relatives, they are obligated to bury him. This is why Maimonides finds a, a connection between uh, uh, laws of mourning and burial, and, 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 and the obligation to defile. By the way, in his book of commandments, we, we were at the Robbins Library and we saw a manuscript of Sefer HaMitzvot, it's a, it's a great, Yemenite manuscript of the Book of Commandments that is here in the library, where Maimonides enumerates all the commandments. He says, how do we know that there is an obligation to mourn from the Torah? Because there is an obligation on the priest to defile themselves to bury, because it's the same principle. And the principle is the weight and dignity given to the dead person God forbid, not leaving his death unaccounted, unnoticed. I come back to my main thought here. As I said, Maimonides is organizing the law very carefully. And him placing the laws of mourning within public constitutional law is because for him, mourning is a collective communal act that defines membership and gives weight. And now we have a very interesting tension about what is mourning. Because you have a whole tradition coming from the Talmud 
that sees mourning as a cathartic action, complex cathartic action. I read it in relationship to the sense of isolation and coming back to the world, isolation and being withdrawn from the world, losing your social persona and coming back to the world. And this is the background, and Maimonides, through a rereading of a Talmudic text in Shabbat, brings in a, a new, I mean, it's not completely new, he can find his own ways in other places of Talmud, brings a new concept of mourning that has to do with membership, the dignity of the dead, defining honor and weight in the community, and he does it through a, a very interesting, intricate I, activity. I just want to say something methodological, at least my experience with Maimonides, especially in the Mishnah Torah. When Maimonides does something new, and here, by the way, in his law that says that uh, a person who has no mourners, you have to bring in people to mourn for him, this is completely new. He would never raise a red flag and said, I'm, something, I'm doing something new here, right? You read the Mishnah Torah and you think, yes, this is, this is presumably the laws of Avel. It's good that we have the Ravat to mention us. No, 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 this has no ground, this has no base. The, the, great, the great eagle, the way he was called, Anesher Agadol, is doing here something completely new. And this is one, just one of occasion, one, one of many occasions of the legal complex work of Maimonides as reflected both structurally in the structure of his law and also in particular laws that usher or introduce a new conception of mourning. I wanted to address this issue and thank you for listening. that really intricate discussion that I think everybody grasps now exactly how radical Maimonides is, mm. but it's very subtle. Right. So, but something massively new happened because of what he did. Right. I wonder, so I'm going to just ask, kick it off with a question, right. and then people from the audience will, will sure, ask. Sure. And I can see somebody here who's... <laughs> got a question already, which is great. Um, I have found it interesting to think about Maimonides as a man versus Maimonides as a uh, great healer, a healer of communities, a, a healer of, of uh, souls, etc. cetera. Um, he seems to be first and foremost concerned with community, with with uh, the preservation of the Jewish community and life, and, and many other things. But there's always a question about how he himself sees these laws. And you have a, a beautiful section in your book where you talk about Maimonides and his brother, right. David. And I wonder if you might just briefly talk about that in relation to how yeah. he speaks about mourning. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important question, and thanks. Maimonides in Laws of Mourning says, Ali tabel adam alamet yoter min right? A person shouldn't, shouldn't mourn for a dead person more than what is needed, because this is dal koshel olam. Death is a way of the world, right? And in a kind of a stoic attitude to acceptance. Acceptance what cannot be reversed or changed. Now, when you see in his own letter, after the death of his own brother, the his brother died. Uh, his brother supported the family, and he, he died in a, in a commercial expedition, drowned in the Indian Ocean. And Maimonides describes his own reaction to that. And he says, uh, he left me, Azavani, right? He left me alone in a foreign land, the death of the brother. And then he says, for a year, I didn't go out of my room. Well, that doesn't follow his halacha, right? 
He basically described an acute experience of depression. Uh, now we have, I think, uh, this ties to another feature of Maimonides. Maimonides was an immigrant, or you might say a refugee. He comes from Andalus, he was born in Cordova, uh, uh, a great place that was destroyed by the, the emergence of a radical Islamic movement. And this all, you know, all the Torah Zahav, all the golden age of, of Andalusian Jewry ended. And the, and the family fled, went through North Africa, ended up through the land of Israel, ended up in Cairo. And Maimonides feels like uh, he has this relationship to the environment which says, you know, I, I come from a great culture. Everything around here is so dull. <laughs> right? Now, the people know, the people around him, when he comes, know this is the jewel of the jewels of this great Jewish world. And they recognize him, but the local elite is very, doesn't like this new great immigrant. We, you people are people everywhere, even Jews of the 12th century, even. So, uh, uh, and he's, he lives in a rather, a, a, so, a, an environment that both admires him and sees him as a kind of threatening alien. And like in many immigrants' lives, the role of the immediate family becomes very important because this is the support group. And we describes the loss of his brother. He describes a loss of a world, right? He left me alone in a foreign land. That's what he says. Uh, and uh, and uh, he also felt guilty. There is guilt in that depress depression. Because wh while he was writing this great text, Mishneh Torah, he was working on it for 10 years. And uh, uh, from, from uh, 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 1167 to 1177. And these were 10 years of, cons of concentration that was given to him by his brother's work. And the brother died while he was supporting the other brother. So he feels there is a guilt there as well. Uh, like, I think depression in grieving situations many times is attached to a deep sense of guilt. And he expresses that. He says, uh, you know, he worked for me. He was there for me. Uh, so, clearly, this is a case where Maimonides recommended Stoicism and didn't practice as himself. I, I just always wonder if he might have written, written something a little different since his, fa his brother died after he after finished the, the mission. After the Mishnah Torah, yeah. His father died before, so anyway. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so there is a question here. Yeah, I took one of my questions. Thank you. He took one of my questions because it's a contradiction between what he wrote and what he actually did. Uh, so the other question is, uh, can you um, reconcile the question that you came up with? Why is Dine Avelut in between Dine Shoftim and Dine Melachim? Right. Uh, what is the rationale that he brought to? And I read your book, so I know the answer, but it might, you might want to answer that. <laughs> well. Uh, Can you that? <clears throat> well, the rationale is, the question was, what is the rationale of the particular placement of laws of mourning? Well, the rationale is, um, it's really, in, in, our, in our legal way we organize law, mourning is, a, is, co is connected to public law. Or you might say even stronger, it's connected to constitutional law. You know, Aristotle says in his work on politics, which Maimonides presumably knew, is that the first function of the constitution is to define membership. Uh, it's not the way we understand constitution, but it must be a, a very deep idea. The first good that the community gives to its citizens before it gives health, welfare, education, whatever it gives, it's membership. And this is why defining the limits and the boundaries of the, the community 
who's a member and who's not, is a constitutive act of communal making law. And this is why, at least from Maimonides' perception, mourning is part of that, the way in which the communal uh, community confers membership upon its inner circle, while this is why he begins with who is not. It comes, if we want to be more nuanced about the actual placing in the Book of Judges, it comes after the section where Maimonides deals with courts and with capital punishment. And, uh, and, uh, that's, and that's for, uh, what is capital punishment? Right? That's, I think, the most troubling aspect of any penal system. It's really a way of declaring someone as completely other, right? as an outsider, where he loses the basic right, not only of a member, but of a human, which is his right to life. So that's, where, that's the logic. It is, what I would say, a moment of constitutional making practice. Morning. I just wanted to say one thing, which thank you very much for keeping your question brief and posing it as a question. I should keep my answers brief as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was supposed to say that, oops, and I fell down on my task there, but I'm saying it now. So we do appreciate just clear, brief questions, and there we go. Um, before your lecture, I would have surmised that in order to make laws of mourning, that you had to have a clear concept of the body, is it real or an illusion, death, what defines it, sure. and what happens after death. Right. Does Maimonides go into this in detail in order to form it? But what I'm learning from your lecture is that it seems that the community, knowing that death is inevitable for everybody, makes a collective decision of how to deal with it. Right. Well, one thing is clear from Maimonides' reading of his proof text, that Maimonides doesn't think of an individual soul hovering, hovering on top of its own body and mourning for itself. Uh, that's an interesting concept that would be very alien to Maimonides. Now, what did Maimonides think? So, you're right, it's clear that the I, I would say the following, even a community that doesn't believe in the afterlife, in the resurrection of the dead, in any of that metaphysical aspect, will practice mourning, in terms at least of Maimonides, out of a respect to the life of the person, not what will happen to him after death. Right? Because that means that uh, people are irreplaceable, or that as a community that respects life, we stop the world after a death. The world stops. So that's independent upon any metaphysical questions about the afterlife, the body, death, etc. By the way, Maimonides has a lot of things to say about that in itself. And one, I, we, we don't want to get into a detailed discussion, but one issue that haunted Maimonides at least he was accused by those who were opposed to him, is whether he believed in resurrection. He wrote a letter, etc. Read the letter and tell me whether you're convinced that he is believing or not. It's a complicated matter. But you write that mourning is independent of those issues when it's defined in these terms. You stated that mourning cannot start until the deceased is buried in the ground. Yeah. Why is that that we don't mourn until they're buried? Okay. By the way, that's a very interesting concept in halakha. There is a stage which is called aninut, onen. Here, again, I need translators' help. Uh, 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 onen is a is a period of time, you would say grieving, but I don't think it's a good uh, translation. Uh, a, a person, when, when a person dies before, before burial, is under no obligations. By the way, it's a liminal moment where he is even not under the obligation to perform mitzvot. I remember from 
the death of my own father, Alav Shalom. He, he died early in the morning, and, and since the burial was already in the, late in the afternoon, we didn't recite the Shema, we didn't put tefillin, we didn't do everything that an observant Jew would do every day. Because, by the way, that's an interesting thing. Because death, the appearance of death into your life before burial crushes all meaning. It's a liminal moment that Allah, it's, it's a fascinating moment that the law suspends itself. It's a rare moment. The law suspends itself when a person who experienced an immediate death before burial, he is outside the realm of the law, including the laws of mourning. It's an interesting concept. Right? There is a Mishnah in Tractat Brachot, chapter, the, 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 uh, chapter 3, Misha Meto Muta Lefana, the person who's dead is, um, um, you know, laid down before him. Patur Mikriyat Shema is, is not, is, is exempt from reciting the Shema. I want him to be fully concentrated and devoted to burial. But I don't think that's the issue. I think something deeper is going on here which is the, the moments in which the, the existence of the dead before you breaks all structures of meaning and normativity, including the norms of grief. And this is why Shiva will start only after burial. And that's, by the way, if we had, a, we want to do a law and emotion, and the whole cycle of mourning, it will be interesting to study that period in, in, in the response to death, an inut, which is a very complex moment. By the way, for Allah that is obsessed with laws and regulations, you know, what do Allah is do in their spare time? They regulate everything, right? <laughs> so, so for them to declare a suspension of the law, in the life of a person is as traumatic as death itself. And it's a response to the trauma of death. So we have about uh, five minutes, I think, and so probably one or two more questions. Okay. Uh, I have a question back here. Um, I was wondering if you could explain, given this reading of mourning as respect for the life of the person and community and, mem and membership, why is there such an aversion or even prohibition against mourning somebody who is not a direct relative? It would seem that that would be, you know, allowed or even embraced if a great sage or a cousin or a beloved friend died that you could also take on these rituals. Well, <clears throat> I, I just want to say one thing. There is no aversion of mourning for someone who is not your relative. By the way, if he doesn't have relatives, you have to mourn for him. At least according to our reading. Mourning is not restricted to relatives. When there are no relatives, the community, ten people, have to see Shiva. So, but the assumption here is that the close the, the, the ones who experience the loss in the stronger sense is the circle around, around the, uh, uh, the dead in his life. But if this circle doesn't exist, it's upon the community to enter. Uh, by the way, it's interesting whether voluntary mourning and to what degree voluntary mourning uh, there, are, there is such a category, there is such a category in, in, in particular cases, especially in, related, in relation to kriya, to tearing on your, your, your um, um, dress and other things. So there is no aversion as such, the other way around. When there are no relatives, everybody is a relative of that dead. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, 
I was curious when you were talking about the, the, the Maimonides' new halakha that uh, an unattached person would have 10 community members right. mourn for him and then the community comforts Comfort them. them. Right. It actually reminded me of the Egla Arufa mitzvah. Right. And I was curious if there's a connection, if you see a connection there between both because it's about the community responding to an unattached situation, a situation where there's no clear sense of, of ownership, right. and because the Egla Arufa mitzvah occurs in Parshat Shoftim, which is all about judges and right. law. So it, there, it's a more, it's an obviously criminal context, whereas in mourning it's not. But I was wondering if both in the placement and in the, and in the assumptions about what communities are supposed to do, if that's another uh, location where a good, it makes a bit more that's sense. A, that's a wonderful point. I, this is referring, for those who don't know the reference, there is the following law, if a dead person is found away in the field, outside of the city, uh, the elders of the nearest city and the community has to come out and perform this ritual and declare, lo et adam aze, our, our hands didn't shed that blood, etc. And uh, you know Maimonides' explanation to this ritual in the Guide of the Perplex. We didn't have a chance to talk about the guide. We, we, there is so much to talk about the guy. Uh, but now that you have raised the question, Maimonides says, um, he doesn't, in his own way, he doesn't consider the beheading of the calf, Egla Rufa, as, a, as an act of um, expiation, kapara, right? This is, this is too far from him. As if you take an animal, you cut the head, and you say, now that I've did it and declare that I have nothing to do with it, I'm fine. It's not the way Maimonides will think about those sort of issues. And he had an ambivalent relationship to the whole question of korbanot, of sacrifices. And he says the following, why is you do it? Because you want to create commotion. So if someone knows who killed that person, he will come out and say it. It's a form of making an anonymous death public. It's a very, by the way, it goes, it's connected to this idea, right? All, all these dying people outside in the road, who knows what happened to them, who killed them, the community has to go out there to perform a ritual to bring. So again, there won't be a, a death that is unmarked unquestioned, as if nothing happened. That's the way Maimonides, again, rereads that practice in The Guide of the Perplexed, another great book that will, good, good chance that we can comment on. My question is about gender, and I'm wondering, I've never read Maimonides right. in the original at all. Right. Um, does he differentiate between a man and a woman mourning, and if the only survivor and the family is a woman. Right. Does she have any rights? Does any of this apply to her? Or is the minion, right. I assume all men, and she has no role that's right. delineated right. for her? Right. Well, there are no gender differentiations in mourning. Uh, you mourn, uh, women have to mourn, you mourn for women. Uh, this is a place, we have enough troubles. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, this is an area that we don't have troubles, right? I mean, it's, it's strange. I mean, maybe Jews become better when they mourn. I don't know. Uh, 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 but Maimonides had a lot of gender issues. I mean, Maimonides on gender is a complicated issue. But in the realm of mourning, and by the way, there is a logic to it. And because death is an equalizer, right? Death is levels, all of us. And there is no gender differentiation in mourning. None. None. Thank you. Seems like a good place to end on something we're doing right, right? <laughs> uh, with that, I just want to say how lucky we've been to have these two speakers here. I hope we can get you both and each back separately and together. And thank you for joining us. Please join me in, in thanking our guests. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.